many of you agree with that? <laughs> yeah, God is good, good, good. And you know, mo many times we don't understand what God's doing. I mean, we really don't. We, you know, we, we have a need and we've prayed and laid it before the Lord. And it just seems like God's not hearing us and <clears throat> he's not answering. And where the heavens seem like brass and it's all shut up and it doesn't seem like it's going that way. And then all of a sudden something happens and you go, oh, I see what you were doing, you know. Now, it wasn't like we thought. And that's the problem with, yeah. Yeah. with what we pray, you know, because the, Isaiah says that you're not, your thoughts are not his thoughts. And your ways are not his ways. And so high are his ways and his thoughts above us. It's like the snows of Mount Hermon above the earth. So we're much separated. Matter of fact, Isaiah goes on to say, all we like sheep have gone astray. And we've turned every man to his own way. You know, every one of you have a way, right? That's what's wrong with you. That's why God had to send a Savior. Because our ways are not his ways. And we all have a way. So really, the surrender of Christianity, to make it, to put it in a nutshell, what you do in Christianity is you surrender your way to his way. And you say, it's no longer my way anymore, it's your way. And when you do this, you make him Lord of your life. You put him on the throne of your life. You step off of the throne and believe me, you'll get back up there if you can. All the time, the fight of the Christian life is to keep yourself off the throne. I'm going to fall off this thing one day. I'm just glad it's not very far to fall. But, but anyway, but, but it's, to, it's to keep yourself off of it and, and let him lead your life. That's what, that's what it is. You can't be the boss anymore. If he's the boss, you can't be the boss. You know, if he's the master, if he's the Lord, you can't be the Lord anymore. You got to wave the white flag and surrender. We used to sing, you know, in church, uh, an invitation call. Yeah, that's right, Deborah. Yeah, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. You know, I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. And of course, I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, O oh blessed Savior, I surrender all. <laughs> I don't know. I can remember the old hymns for some reason. They were just really important. In life. But, but that's, that's what it is, you know, you're surrendering all. Well, all right, and we're in Revelation, and uh, we're, today we get to go to heaven. How about that? <laughs> Hallelujah. We've been dragging around on earth for about 15 messages down here. It's time to get to heaven. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We got to go to heaven sooner or later. And uh, that's, the, you know, the book of Revelation has its own natural outline. I know you're aware of this, those of you that have been coming. But in the 19th chapter of the first verse, I mean, of the first chapter, 19th verse of the first chapter, um, Jesus, in the, through, speaking through the Spirit of God, says, all right, here's what this book is about. I'm going to show you the things that you have seen, which is the glory of Jesus Christ and the mastery of Jesus Christ. You've already seen that on the earth. That's already been demonstrated to you. So I'm going to show you the things which you have seen. Everybody say chapter 1. That's what the whole chapter is about. It's about King Jesus. And the glorious Jesus, and conquering Jesus, and then the things which are now. And then he spends two chapters, chapters two and three, sending letters to seven churches. And these seven churches are very interesting because they just happen to coincide. Whew, how many of you know there are no accidents with God? <laughs> that coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous, Right? People, it's a coincidence. Well, oh, God does all these things, and uh, they just kind of seem that way <laughs> because God's the author of all of the things. And anyway, in chapters, two, in chapter two and three, you get letters to churches that really represent churches that go through the periods of time in the time of the Gentiles, which you are a Gentile. 
Uh, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And the age that we're in right now is the age of the Gentiles. Yeah. The age of the Gentiles means that there is salvation opened up to those who are, who are not Jews, to anyone. Jesus said, whosoever will, let him come. And now it's no longer limited to a, to a group of people that have a special covenant with God, but it's open to everybody. And so there's a period of time that God works that way, and it's called the, the day of the Gentiles or the age of the Gentiles. One of these days, the age will close. It'll stop being the age of the Gentiles. But during that age, there are the churches on the earth, and churches are functioning and preaching the message, and the Holy Spirit's moving in the lives of people, and they're being converted to the Lord and coming to God in faith and everything. And so Jesus says, all right, here's the way things are. And he gives us seven churches, and they have all kind of issues, and they have all kind of ages, you know. And they just happen to correspond with the ages that we have seen historically. We know how they were and what years they covered, and it just like, and then we find ourselves in Laodicea, which is the last church age, clearly the last letter to the last church, and it describes how things will be, spiritually speaking. And we found out that we're nothing, <laughs> we're not doing too good, which we all know anyway. We know that. And he said, I wish you were either hot or cold. Now, that's an amazing statement to make yeah, yeah. because if we're all hot, I could understand you, him saying, I wish you were hot because that would be, you know, passionate, on fire for me and all that. But he says, or cold. <laughs> Cold just means, you know, that you reject things. Did you know that God is not disturbed by your doubt? Did you know that? If you're an honest doubter. Now, you can be a dishonest doubter, and, and, and that's not going to get you anywhere. But if you are an honest doubter, what is doubt going to cause you to do? Yeah, research. And when you research, you will find that God is true to his word. Do you know some of the greatest books that we have available to us now that prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ are, were written by people who went into that book writing trying to prove he didn't raise from the grave? Josh McDowell, C.S. Lewis, others, you know. I mean, these are some of the greatest writers that prove that. I mean, they're called apologists. Don't ask me why they use that word. But when you defend the Scripture, it's called apology comes from some Latin shenanigans or something. But anyway, it's, but your apologetic means you defend something. And so the greatest defenders of uh, Christ rising started out writing books and say, I'm going to prove he didn't come back. But uh, in the writing of the book, they proved to themselves he actually did come back. And so then they said, Lord, you're real. Come into my life. So if you're an honest doubter, it's okay. That's why he said, I wish you were cold. Because if you're cold, I can make you hot. But because you're lukewarm, now this is the problem. If we're lukewarm, what does that mean? It means that we don't care. Right. I mean, we're, we're flat. We're unimpressed. We don't really, we don't passionately dislike something or passionately love it. It's like, uh, take it or leave it. Now, if that's your attitude, it's hard for God to work in your life. And sadly, this is the way America really is this, these days. I mean, you try to talk to your neighbor about the Lord, and they, they're not ugly to you. They try to be polite, but they're not interested in, in, in the work of God. I mean, they're just, you know, they're just lukewarm. You try to talk to your own family, some members of your own family about the Lord, and, and they're, they, they, they pay attention, and they don't want to hurt your feelings, but it's just water on the duck's back, you know? It just, whoop, right off because they really don't care about it. And so Jesus said, well, you're not hot and you're not cold. You're lukewarm. Eh, that makes me sick. And the phrase the old King James uses is, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And that's just the old English way of trying to be polite because the actual word means I'm going to vomit you. I mean, that's a, that's a little bit different than spew, right? It's a little deeper, a little deeper sensation going on here. It's a little more passion. I mean, it's like Jesus said, you make me sick. Blah, you know. Well, that's the age we live in. 
And this is the last church age, which means he's coming at the end of this one. There are no more church ages. The times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. And there will be a line somewhere that will cross and boom, there it'll be. And there are no more church ages. There are no more letters to any more churches. And the church itself will be called off of this earth. Because the church is not a building. When we talk about the church, who are we talking about? Kind of point at you and go, <laughs> right here. When we're asking in these praise songs and worship songs, fill this place, Lord. What are we asking for? Like a cloud to come down in this building and mystify all of us? I mean, some smoky residue or some gold dust sprinkling out of the ceiling? What, I mean, what? When you say, fill this place, what are you singing for? You're saying, fill the tabernacle that you dwell in, and that just happens to be in my heart, in my, in my being, in my soul. The Spirit of God houses itself inside me. And so one of these days, me is going to be gone. <laughs> and so Revelation chapter 4, this is you going to heaven. This is Jesus coming after you. This is, this is what it's all about. You say, Pastor, why do you believe this? Because, you know, there are people that believe that the church gets raptured. And by that word, I simply mean called out. Rapture is not even a Bible word. It's actually a Latin word that was created by an old scholar by the name of Jerome back in, 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 in ancient days to talk about a great upgathering. It's, it's a Latin word that means to be caught up. And then we took it on as Christians because we like the way it sounds. You know, it's like going to be raptured. Sounds nice, doesn't it? You know, and it just means I'm going to be snatched away like a thief would snatch away something valuable. You know, I'm going to just be there one minute and the next minute I'm not there. It's like, oh my goodness, man. It's like old man Enoch in the, in the Old Testament. The Bible says Enoch walked with God. And then the next line said, and was not. That means somebody saw him walking down the road and said, there goes old man Enoch down the road. Wait, where, where'd he go? You know, He walked with God, and then all of a sudden, God just took him. Boom. Unbelievable. But this is what's going to happen to us one day. You say, well, why, why, you know, people believe that this great upgathering happened at different times. Some people say that the church is going to go all the way through to the end of tribulation, the seven years of horror and judgment and wrath of God being poured out on this earth. We're entering this period, by the way. We're going to spend two chapters, four and five, in heaven around the throne, and you'll get to see what that's all about and all these symbols and pictures and so forth. And they're, they're great. I mean, they all are perfect and match everything, and you get to see all of this. And then in chapter six, the judgments begin. The seals get opened. Seal one, seal two, seal three, seal four, and woo, disaster just begins to pour out. And then when the seventh seal is open, trumpets start sounding. Boom, trumpet one, two, three, four, five, and demons are loose, and Satan is cast out of heaven in a very unceremonious way. <laughs> And God just mistreats him, you know, <laughs> just humiliates him and throws him down to earth. And he's all hot and mad about it. And he takes it out on the earth. But it's rough. Supernatural things begin happening. Woo! De demons are loose from the pit and Satan himself is just causing all kinds of chaos down here. And you would think it couldn't get worse than that. But then the vials, the bowls. When the seventh trumpet sounds, all of a sudden, bowls get dumped out. First bowl, horrible, wrath of God, great, you know, a fourth of the earth being burned up, a third of the sea turning to blood. I mean, big, massive, uh, earth-convulsing things. I mean, the earth is being chastised by the wrath of God. And then the second bowl gets worse, and the third is worse than that, and the fourth is, oh, unbelievably horrible, and the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh. So chapters 4 through 18, most of the book is about that seven-year period. Isn't that amazing? 
Did you know about a fourth of the Gospels or about the last week of Jesus' life? Have you ever noticed that? You read the Gospels, and about a quarter of what the Gospels say is about the last week of Jesus' life. It just tells you stuff about what he did and where he went, but then it focuses on the last week, and we get a lot of information about the last week. The book of Revelation tells you things about other times, but it focuses on that seven-year period and what happens, and it's just like, you know, these things happen, and then boom, these things happen, and then boom, these things happen, and there's just all kind of stuff going on, horrible times it is called the wrath of God, and it's, some of the prophets wrote about it, and it's just, you know, beyond imagination. It's called the time of trouble and the time of Jacob's trouble, and it's called the worst that's ever poured out on the earth. It's horrible. But some people believe that the church goes through all that. And then at the end, when Jesus saves tiny little Israel from being destroyed, at the Battle of Armageddon, when Jesus puts his foot on the Mount of Olives and it splits. By the way, the Howard Johnson people tried to build a hotel on the Mount of Olives but couldn't get a permit. You know why? There's a gigantic fault under the mountain. Yeah, just ready to split when Jesus steps on one side and the other. Yeah, and that horse, the blood's going to run as deep as a horse's bridles. It's going to be a tremendously, we're going to watch it, by the way. We'll be there. We'll be on the sidelines in the cheering stands. Yeah, that's a cop. That's right. We'll just be, we'll be all rejoicing because it, even though they call it the battle of Armageddon, it's not much of a battle. Jesus speaks a word and boom, it's over. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's quicker than a Mike Tyson fight. You know, I mean, it's just like <laughs> hit somebody, buddy, and they out, you know. First 15 seconds, you wasted your money on a TV behind it because it was over before it even began. And some people say the church is going to go through that. Now, does that make sense to you? I mean, would you, do you think God wants to punish us? No. Why? We're his. We're, the, the Bible calls us the bride of Christ. Yeah, yeah. In other words, we're going to marry Jesus when we get to heaven. Mm -hmm. So is God a wife abuser? Is God punishing us for what? For loving him? For serving him? For, I mean, is he going to drag us through this horrible judgment? Just why? Why would he do that? It doesn't make a bit of sense. Then some people believe that we're going to be taken out right in the middle of the seven-year tribulation period. Because the Bible says the last three and a half years are going to be way worser than... <laughs> Let me say, let me correct that, way more worse. -er. <laughs> the last three and a half years is going to be way more worse -er than the first three and a half years because the Antichrist is going to be trying to deceive everybody the first three and a half years and convince everybody he's wonderful and awesome. He's going to solve the problems of the world. He loves everybody. And, oh, he's just, but he's masquerading this. He's setting them up to trust him so he can get them right where he wants them. And he's going to do that. And then the last three and a half years, the nation of Israel is going to have to run for its lives. They're going to hide in the mountains and the caves and everywhere. And it's going to be hunter Jew time, you know, worse than Hitler. And it's going to be horrible. And that's when the beast and the Antichrist and the false prophet are on the earth, the anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Holy Spirit, Satan trying to imitate God. Can't do it, though. Because I know, I know you know this, but whether you believe it or not, Satan is not any kind of match for God. Satan is not like God. God is eternal. You know what this means? God doesn't have a beginning and he doesn't have an end. When something is eternal, it means it never, there's no place that you can say it started here and it has certainly no place there. And then there's the term everlasting, which is what happens to you. You and I are everlasting beings, which means we do have a start, but we don't have an end. You are given everlasting life. It means all for all ever. You, you, you had a beginning, but you're going to never have an end. And so anyway, the Antichrist, some people say right in the middle, right before that three and a half years of disaster, God's going to, he's going to let us go through a little bit of the tribulation period. Again, the question would be, why would he do this? 
He wants us to have just a little bit of torture. I mean, he wants us to kind of get roughed up a little bit, you know, and what, you know, maybe soften us up for the kingdom. I, I, why, would, why would he want to abuse his bride? Is he angry at his bride? No, God is not dysfunctional. God is not a bully. And he's not a teetering old man in a cosmic Santa Claus either, which is the way lots of people think about God. Give me, give me, give me in Jesus' name. Our prayers are like a shopping list. Give me, give me, give me, give me in Jesus' name. Like God's a vending machine in heaven or something. You know, whatever. whatever. So why would, I, why would I believe and why would I try to teach you and compel you that, that the Lord takes us away before any of that tribulation starts on this earth? Well, here's why. One is that right now we're about to read the first verse of the fourth chapter. The trouble starts in chapter 6. Chapters 4 and 5 are a, is a worship service in heaven. We're about, to, we're about to step into a worship service in heaven. And we're going to see what's happening in heaven. And John, who is a representative of the church, John probably one of the first believers in Jesus Christ, certainly full of the spirit of Jesus Christ, one of the apostles of Jesus Christ, who was on the Isle of Patmos punished for being a believer in Jesus Christ, representing all of the church, I think God says, come up here. Boom, come on up. Which perfectly corresponds with what I believe the te Scripture teaches us about the rapture and when it will happen. So we have perfect timing in the book of Revelation also, here's another thing. 18 times in the first three chapters, the word church appears. From chapters 4 through 18, guess how many times the word church appear? Zero. Which would indicate what? Well, we're not there. <laughs> there is no church because the church is sitting in heaven looking at what's happening on earth. In chapters 6 through 18, we're, we're around the throne, man. I mean, we've already been through the judgment seat of Christ. We've got crowns on. We've got, you know, we're worshiping. You'll see us. You'll see us there. We, 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 what are we doing? We're just part of the heavenly worship and praise service. So there you go. And then the events that are described by, by Paul in Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians correspond with this all of a sudden being snatched out. I mean, just like everything's going on as usual. People are getting married and people are having babies and people are going to the grocery store and they have their shopping list. I mean, the you know, Bible says that life will go on as if nothing was happening, just like in the days of Noah. The people didn't know until the water car started falling out of the sky that old man Noah, who they thought was crazy, building this giant boat up there in his yard, you know, he actually had a point. <laughs> They didn't know that until the rain started falling. Everybody say, then it's too late. Yeah, right, right. Well, Jesus said that's the way the coming of the Son of Man is going to be. People are going to be marrying and giving in marriage. Business is going to be going on like usual. Everything's going to be happening until all of a sudden we're just stoop, snatched out. So I believe personally that we are snatched out before any of this horrible stuff appears. Because we're not talked about anymore after this. Here, here we come. And let me just read these verses and then I'll show you real quickly because it's time for you to go almost. Um, <laughs> after these things, I look, you know, those of you that don't know why people are laughing, you'll figure it out in a minute. All right. Yeah. <laughs> you'll figure it out in a minute. Oh, and after these things, look at this description. And after these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Now, remember, when, when John starts talking to us about what heaven looks like, he's talking to us about a place we've never seen. And this place has stuff in it that we wouldn't even know what it was if we saw it. Because heaven's not like earth. Heaven doesn't have time. Like earth has past, present, and future. In heaven, everything's just present. <laughs> There's no night in heaven. Good night. It's just unbelievable. Everything is different in heaven. 
And remember, God is a spirit. The Bible tells us God is a spirit. This is in John 4. The same one that wrote, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house for many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you and I go to prepare. St. John, two chapters earlier, says God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So when he tries to describe God, think about that. How are you going to describe something that doesn't have a body? It's just a presence of some supernatural something. It's like, wow. And even if you could describe it, could any of us conceive of that? It'd be like, and I put it in your nose, it'd be like an original aborigine, you know, who's never been out of the bush of Australia, comes to America and then goes back and tries to describe to his tribe members what he saw in America. They've never seen a microwave oven. They don't know what a, a, a modern automobile is like. And they've certainly never cooked on a range or an oven. And I mean, just a, a, a vacuum cleaner. I mean, just think of the common thing. And how would you describe that? That's the trouble that John has in giving us a picture of what all these things in heaven are like. But because the book of Revelation is not a book trying to confuse you. See, there are a lot of people that never look at Revelation. You know why? Because they think God on purpose made it confusing so we could really never read it and, and get the truth out of it. But that's the exact opposite. God says, you can understand this. Look at your neighbor and say, you are going to understand this. Oh, yeah, you're going to understand. Now, you might not like a lot of it, but you're going to understand what it means. Because the revelation means the revealing, removing the covering. What once was covered up, now is not covered up anymore. And you are the generation that needs to know this, so God is inspiring his messengers, which, you know, I am. I mean, I mean I, I've been in, with the Lord 40 years in the ministry I'm seeing things I've never seen before. God's opening up. How many of you know that truth is not discovered? Truth is revealed. I, you don't just read along and all of a sudden, whew, I just discovered something. No, God just revealed it to you. And you've had this happen if you read your Bible. I know you have. You read a verse, you know, you've read it hundreds of times, and then all of a sudden you read it, and it's like, boom, that thing comes alive to you, and you go, whoo, I never saw that. And God reveals it to you. Some of you are sitting in this sanctuary right now. You've never, you've never read one verse out of the book of Revelation. The devil has scared you away from it all of your life. You thought, I'll never understand that weird craziness and all that kind of stuff. But the book itself in the first chapter said, blessed are you who hear the words, read the words of this book and hear the words of this book and do the things that are written herein. You are blessed. And at the end of the book, it says the same thing. It says, blessed are you if you read these things that are written in the book and you hear it and you do it and you obey it. it you're going to be blessed. And it goes so far at the end to say, if you try to change any of it, you're going to be cursed with all the cursings that are listed in this book if you take away any of the words of this prophecy. Man, God's serious about this book. I believe every book in the Bible can bless you. But this one comes with it written right in there. If you want to be blessed, read this book. But the devil doesn't want God's people to read this book. So let's uh, convince them it's uh, confusing that nobody can really understand all these weird images. Mm. God's people can. The Holy Spirit can interpret it for us. And I'm going to tell you what, it's going to be easy to see all of these things because they all are found in the Bible. All of these images and these symbols are found in the Old Testament for the most part. And you have to, as long as you can remember this, all of these symbols are known to the people to whom this book was written. This book was written to the churches that were described in chapters 2 and 3. These, these churches that were around 100 A.D., right in there when John wrote all of this. 90 A.D., 85 A.D., right around in that period of time right in there. 
And so there were certain things that were true about their life back then. And, and, and John uses symbols that are familiar to them. So when we try to read it, as long as we remember what this is about is, a, is, is John is trying to talk to people who have never seen anything like what he's viewing in terms that they could understand in some way the awesomeness of what's, what he's talking about. Remember, they've never seen a, an Abrams tank. They've never seen fire shooting out of a muzzle. They've never seen an Apache attack helicopter that looked like a locust with fire coming, coming out of his tail. How would you describe it? And they're just trying to describe it in a way that would make sense, you know. And they said, well, I've never seen anything like that. And I'm sure you hadn't. So what could I talk? What could I say? So we'll see it and we'll understand it and God will help you, God will help you through it. Okay, so here we go. God looks, there's a, there's a voice, uh, there's an open door in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, by the way, have we heard this trumpet voice before? Who has this trumpet voice? Jesus. So Jesus speaks to John and says to him, Come up here, and I'll show you the things which must take place after this. Come on up, John. You need to see this. So here goes the church. Here goes the Spirit of God drawing the church off the earth. John representing all of us. Immediately, he says, I was in the Spirit. Just like the Bible tells us the rapture is going to be. Boom. One minute you're there. Boom. One minute you're not. Where did he go? Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one set on the throne. So when he gets to heaven, the first thing he sees is the throne of God. Now let me tell you something about the throne. All the action in heaven centers around the throne. The the throne is mentioned about 19 or 20 times. I mean, it is the focus point of heaven, this throne that is in there. And all the stuff happens around the throne of God. And everything rotates. It's the center of the universe. And so John says, man, there was a throne there. It was like unbelievable. You can't believe it. And then he starts trying to describe what, what, what the throne's like. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius. How many of you have ever seen a sardius stone? You even know what that is? Do you know what jasper is? Okay, jasper is diamond, and sardius is ruby. So John looks at who's on the throne, and remember, God is a spirit, and they must worship him, must worship him in spirit and truth. So God wasn't sitting there like some human body. God's essence is in the throne, and John said, you know, the best thing I can do is describe, hey, he, was, he, was, he was on the throne, uh, and he looked like, you know what he looked like? He looked like diamond with flashing ruby flashing all out of him. What are diamonds? Why would he use diamonds? Well, two things about them, right? Their brilliance. I mean, my goodness, you guys, you ladies wear your diamonds. And diamonds are a girl's best friend, as we know. And you get in the right light and it just, choo, choo, it just flashes. Boy, it's just so beautiful. But, but diamonds are not only brilliant and bright and flashing and beautiful, they're also very hard. They're one of the hardest substances on earth. They use diamond tip stuff to cut, you know, impossibly hard things. They have diamond tips on them with little pieces of diamond that, that can penetrate or cut these terribly hard surfaces like the granites and all the others are used diamond tips, man. What does that mean? That that's the hardest substance on earth. Which just means God is hard. That's not complicated, is it? And we want God to be hard. Because we depend on God being hard. I mean, really, right? Look at the laws of our world. Are they hard? Yep. They, are, they, they stay the same no matter what. How many of you have tried to say something like this? Man, I just wish I had more time. <laughs> oh my goodness, I wish we could just stop time. And have... How many of you have ever had time stop? 
You've never had time stop. Time, time is hard. And, and, and our lives depend on it being hard and nobody being able to stop it and make it go back or forth. God's hard. How many of you, when you put ice in a freezer, expect it to become, I mean, water in a freezer, you expect it to be ice when you open it up and not steam? Well, it's going to be ice. Why? Because laws of thermodynamics and, you know, mechanical laws, and it happens every time, right? Some, it's not sometimes steam and sometimes rock, and we depend on that. Every, act, every action has an opposite or equal reaction. One of the laws of physics. We depend on that in our lives to be true every time. We want it to be hard. Gravity. When it, you know, if I drop this, uh, it's going to go down every time and not up. That's a hard law of physics, the law of gravity, and we depend on that law working the same way every time. So God is hard like a diamond because we need him to be hard. And like he's physically hard, he's morally hard. He's righteously hard. Now, we don't think so. But he tells us like in Galatians 6, 7, what does he say to us in Galatians 6, 7? Be not deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, he shall reap of the flesh, rotten flesh. But if he sows to the Spirit, he shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Life everlasting starts, but no hurry ends. Good night. And God means that. Just as much as he means gravity and thermodynamics and motion and physical laws, he's just as hard on the moral laws and the righteous laws of life. So John looks at him and said, man, he looks like a diamond. Jasper's their word for diamond. Looks like a diamond. Holy smokes. And he's got, he's got this flashing red like a ruby, which is the, the, the flashing red just, you know, you know, Deuteronomy said, our God is a consuming fire. So I'm sure John saw the brilliance of God and the fiery, fiery judgment, the holiness of God righteously flashing against unjust sin. And as long as there's sin on the earth, the righteousness and the holiness of God is going to be flared up in, 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 in torment and judgment and punishment. So it, John said, when I saw him, the essence of him on that throne, I saw a brilliant, brilliant hardness and I saw holiness against sin flashing all around him. He said, I, I don't know what else to say. I, 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 thought, I don't know if he was sitting on it or if, he, if the throne was sitting on him or he was around it or what. And then he's going to go on now and he's going to say, I'm going to tell you something else about it. Because he's not through describing the throne and what's going on. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Whoo, scary stuff. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Does the Holy Spirit, are there seven Holy Spirits? Negatory. You, don't, you have one Holy Spirit. It has seven realities. Isaiah, you remember, we went back and read. Isaiah said, the Spirit of God have certain qualities in them. The Spirit of God has seven different revelations of what he is in. The spirit of knowledge, the spirit of righteousness, the, the spirit of fear of God. I mean, it, it lists all seven of them. It's not confusing who they are. It's one Holy Spirit. It's like the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, the Bible says that we as God's children are filled with fruit. And then it says, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, goodness, meekness, and temperance. Boom. There are the nine. But he says, the fruit of the Spirit is. 
for all you English majors, what type of word is is? I mean, as far as its gr grammar, what is it in grammar? It is a single verb, right? It's in the singular tense. If you said there are nine of them, you would think the fruit of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit are. You think God just doesn't know grammar? I mean, you think that's really why that doesn't say that? No. He says there's a singular fruit of the Spirit. It just manifests itself in nine different flavors. It's like we have a tree called the fruit of the Spirit, and on that tree are nine different kind of fruits on the tree. It's the same. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It just manifests itself in different ways. It's peace. It's love. It's joy. It's long-suffering, it's gentleness, it's goodness, it's faith, it's meekness, and temperance. Well, the Holy Spirit is that way. There are seven aspects to the Holy Spirit that are all qualities of the Holy Spirit, but there's only one Holy Spirit, and he's got a bunch of f lamps with fire up there, and he's before the throne of God, and the Holy Spirit's there, and, and God the Father's there. Ooh, it's awesome. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass. Like crystal, I'll tell you a minute, we'll, we'll, we'll go through this real quick. And in the midst of the throne and around the, thro around the throne were four living creatures. These cats are weird, man. I mean, when you hear them describe, you'll understand why, they call, why he calls them creatures. Because they are creatures. Because they don't look like anything you've seen on earth. A lot of the UFO wackos, uh, and you may be one of them. I mean, I, look, I don't care. But, one, but, but the ones, the ones that, that really believe, really, truly that there are, and I mean, they want to try to prove it, they, they'll use this description like this and some of these flying beings around the throne to, to say, see, the Bible talks about UFOs. Look at that. Well, they, they, they are UFOs. <laughs> Unforgettable flying objects. They're, they're weird. They are unknown to us. But hey, if it is a UFO like some aliens from somewhere, they're flying around the throne praising God. So hey, they're our brothers. So let them go. But John said, I saw them. And when I saw them, it was like four of them flying. And look, this is not the only description. He's going to keep on describing them. I'm just not going to talk about that today. I mean, we'll go through every other verse. I mean, it's, it's going to be there. So God, you know, God, God's in heaven at the throne. This throne is described. Now, I, I've chosen, like a preacher will do. Everybody say, okay, you are a preacher. All right, like a preacher will do to give you some points so you can hang your hat on what this throne is all about. Because this throne is the center of heaven, guys. This throne, all the action will take place around the throne. You need to kind of get a feel for this throne. And let me give it to you real quick because I don't want to drag it out. But I do want you to get it. All right. Why uh, all of the descriptions of the throne, the colors and the, and the people around it and the number of stuff and the crystal sea and the emerald rainbow. and all, I mean, all of that means something. Okay, so uh, what does it mean? Why, why, would, uh, why would it be described that way? All right, well, the emerald rainbow... When, now, how many of you have ever seen a rainbow? A, I mean, a, a completed rainbow, right? A completed rainbow is circular. Have you ever seen a circular rainbow? I have too. Uh, it's really easy to see. All rainbows are circular. Did you know this? Yeah. Whether you only see half of it or not, it's still circular. All rainbows are circular. When you get up above them, like if you were flying in an airplane or you were on top of a really tall building you might be able to see the completion of that circle of the rainbow. How many of you have ever seen an emerald rainbow? Negative. Me either. All the rainbows we see are yellow, red, blue, and, you know, the colors. John said, man, there was like this rainbow, uh, an emerald rainbow. Good night. Well, well emerald, uh, the color of the earth is green. So basically what he's saying is that I use the rainbow because this throne is there for judgment of this earth. This throne is where the earth is going to be judged and all the people that reject Christ. God is not mad at his bride, but the people who rejected his son are going to be in deep trouble. And the throne is a throne of judgment, not of grace. 
Grace is over with. When we're snatched up, boom, Holy Spirit snatched up, boom, no, oh my goodness. There will be some people saved. Don't get me wrong, but it won't be you. <laughs> Sadly, it won't be you because you've already heard and you rejected it. Oh, so welcome, welcome. But he says, you know, this guy on the throne was like jasper, like a flashing diamond and a flashing ruby, and there was a rainbow and a rainbow, and I put it in your notes. Uh, a rainbow is there because of all the geometric figures that could be used. The circle is the picture of perfection, of flawless. Just saying to you that the throne has no crack. It has no faults. It is perfect. There's no beginning of a circle and no end of a circle. It just continues forever and ever. And, and so what he's saying is that this thing has to do with earth and it's perfect. It's not going to be uh, perverted in any way and it's not going to be biased in any way and it's not going to have somebody telling, you know, some goofy half-truth about something and all that because God knows everything. God knows where you were, what you said, what you looked at, how long it took you and why you were there. He knows everything about you. It's called omniscience. Look it up. God knows it all, so there'll be no place to hide. Holy smoke. And so that's the throne. So it, it, it says the, the throne is flawless. That's what the symbols recognize, and it's formal. Here are the elders. Did you notice the verse around the throne were 24 thrones? And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. This just means that around the big throne, there were 24 little thrones. But sitting on the little thrones were somebody, some people he called elders. Now, some people would say, well, that means they were angels. No. The angels in all of the Bible are never called elders. You never see a passage that calls an angel an elder. Elders are always in connection with those who are spiritually blessed in, in wisdom and wisdom to lead the church and to be help in the church and to, and to lead the kingdom of God in righteousness and right ways. They would be people you could count on, people you could trust, people full of the Holy Spirit, people full of wisdom and to help move and guide the kingdom of God. They're all mentioned with the church. So, who are they sitting on these little thrones? And there were 24 of them. Let me just say to you that the number 12 is governmental perfection. Jesus had 12 apostles. There were 12 tribes of Israel. 12 means perfect government. So, there, there, there are two 12s here. There are 24 of them. Boom. A lot of people say, well, the reason there are 24 is because God takes 12 Old Testament saints, the big boys, and God takes 12 New Testament apostles, all of the apostles, you know, Matthew and John and, and Luke and Matthias and blah, blah, and Paul replaces Judas as an apostle. It, I don't know. That's the traditional view. I don't really know whether that's right or not because it's kind of weird because John would be saying, well, I'm sitting on one of those thrones because I'm one of the apostles. But he doesn't make any note of that like, ooh, I saw myself sitting on a throne. Kind of be weird, right? But we do know they're representatives of the church because of the way they're described. Look at the way they're described. And I, they're, they're sitting on these thrones. Now, they're not judging anything. They're just like the cheerleading squad. When God does what he does on the throne, they just go wild with worship and adoration. They're not sitting there like, okay, well, is he lost or, or, or he said... No, no, no. They're not helping God judge anything because the word crowns on their head, this is just a little, you need to know this. The word for crown on God's head is diadem. Diadem is a kingly crown, a crown of authority. Every time it talks about a crown on God's head, it, the word diadem is used. Every time it talks about the other crowns, the word Stephanos is used. Stephanos means a crown like an athlete who wins a race would, would wear. Like a, like a laurel wreath made of gold that, that's like, you won the race. You performed well. You did good. You get the crown. These guys have crowns on their head. 
which means they've already been past the judgment seat of Christ, which means that they're in heaven and they've already stood before the throne of Jesus and, and he said, you deserve the crown of righteousness. You deserve the crown of glory. You deserve the, the, the crown of uh, rejoicing, you know, the soul winner's crown. And there are five different crowns, and, and you got some of them. These guys got, have some of them. They're there, and they clothed in white, which is the way God described all through those seven churches. He said, if you'll follow me and come to me and overcome, I'll let you be dressed in white in the kingdom of God. And those aren't angels. Those are, those are representatives of the church. So it's very formal. How many of you have ever been in a place that just the dignity of the place made you nervous? I'm serious. You walked in there, and man, when you walked in there, that room was so awesomely formal and dignified. It just kind of made you start shaking on the inside, like, mm -hmm. oh man, I'm in a, you know, oh. you could just feel it, man. I, oh, God is around. God is a place that is like that, and these thrones are arranged, and all these special people and stuff like that, and whoo, man, it's going to be, it's going to be kind of scary because of how formal it is, and then the fearful judgment, sights and sound, from, uh, and from the throne proceed lightnings and thunderings and voices and seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, I mean, this is the throne of judgment, and there's going to be noise, Rah! like, you know, and, and peeling out. I mean, Katrina's nothing compared to the sound. You know, how many of you were here during Katrina? You stayed here. You remember that overwhelming, you know, just sound like a freight train coming. Like, it sounded like crickets riding on a turbo or something. I mean, it did it. And it blew that way for 12 hours. And then every once in a while, it go, when the tornadoes went, you know, flying over the top of the house and blowing all the shingles. Every, every shingle on the back side of my house got blown off. Not one was missing from the front side. Whew, my neighbor's tree was twisted off about three quarters of the way up and laying in my front yard. Thank the Lord that thing jumped over my house. It got just enough to blow the shingles off. Tanya and I were in the middle closet, could hear the, could hear the two by fours creaking. I'm thinking Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. I'm thinking, no place like home, no place like home. <laughs> That's nothing compared, Ruby Silver. That's nothing compared to the frightening and fearful sounds that are around the throne of God. It's going to be a scary place to be. Holy smokes, as the judgment of God boils out against the earth and the spirit, the seven spirits are there, because the Holy Spirit is participating in this thing. That means, buddy, you ain't getting away with nothing. Because the Holy Spirit's been down here, boy. He knows what's happening with all this stuff. He's been convicting you. That's that anxiousness you feel inside you. If you're sitting there going, man, I need to change. Oh, God. That's the Holy Spirit creating that desire in you. If you say, boy, I need to get ready to go, yeah, that's the Holy Spirit moving in you. That's what he does. And so he's there, so it's factual, it's final judgment. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne, around the throne, were four living creatures, eyes in the front and back. All right, it's final in its judgment. It means that this is uh, the final act of judgment. It means it's the end of the road, and, and he uses that that crystal sea thing, because look, there is nothing so volatile as the sea, right? Like go down to the beach and watch the waves and watch the little flickers and watch all of that kind of stuff. And the sea is always in motion. I mean, whether it's small or big or, or waves or just, you know, little things like that. When you look at the ocean, it is never like glass. It is just always some little movement, the tides go in and out and up. And so there, there is nothing so volatile as the sea. But notice what it said this sea was. This sea was like crystal, Ooh, which means it ain't moving. How many of you have ever handled glass like a big mirror or something? You get it out of whack, <laughs> it is very rigid. It does not handle flexibility. It whew, cracks and all this kind of stuff. So what he's saying here is that this, this sea that was before the throne was fixed and hard and was unchangeable. 
It was like a sea of glass. Nothing more uh, uh, unchanging than glass. And, and rigid, rigid is the word I'm looking for. This is rigid. This means it's already been decided. So you might as well not even try to lie or whatever you want to do. And then it's fundamental because of the living creatures. These creatures are full of eyes, which just means this is based on God seeing everything and knowing everything. These guys are weird. Listen, you're going to keep on seeing these living creatures. They, got all, they have all kind of characteristics. <sighs> they are. I mean, I, they not only have, are full of eyes, they got lots of other things that are weird. But these living creatures are probably cherubim angels. I'll make it short. I'm, I'm, I'm quitting. Cherubim angels are what... Uh, the archangels. There are three archangels, Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. That's the only ones named in the Bible. Michael, of course, is the warring angel that protects Israel. Gabriel is the messenger angel that brought the Mary, Mary the message and all that kind of stuff. And then Lucifer was the angel that led worship in heaven. Was. Until he said, I'm the biggest and the best and the brightest and I'm going to be God. And God said, boop, you out of here. And, uh, and that's why Satan gets so mad when we worship, because it reminds him of what he used to do. Hey, we took his place. We took his place. And so, and so here they are, these crazy creatures, and they're there, and they're flying around, and they're going to be doing all kinds of stuff. So it's fundamental, and then it's fatal judgment, uh, which is the last little aspect. And this is not seen by what, it is said there, it's, by, it's seen by what is not said there. All right? God the Father is on the throne. The Holy Spirit is manifesting in seven lights on the, around the front of the throne. Uh, is there somebody missing? Who? Jesus the Lamb is not at the throne. Which means there's no mercy there. There's no grace there. There's no Lamb. You remember what, what, what Isaac said to Jacob? When Jacob was carrying him up the mountain to, you know, Isaac looks up at him and says, Dad, uh, here's the knife, which is the weapon of death. Here's the fire, which is the weapon of judgment. After something's dead, burn it up. It's, that's the judgment. So I've got the death and the judgment, but where's the lamb? And you know what Jacob said to God? He said, God, him, God will provide the lamb. And he does. And thank God he does. But there's no lamb here. It means there's no mercy here. There's no salvation here. It's all been decided. Now, the lamb's going to appear quickly, but he ain't going to be like you think he is. It's not going to be sweet little Jesus born in a manger. It's going to be coming King Jesus, like the lion of the tribe of Judah. Whoo! All I can say is get ready, get ready, get ready. All right, stand your feet. Stand your feet.